So being from Boston, um, Boston Marathon bombing really rocked like my family, um, our community as a whole. And we as a group decided that we wanted to find a way to prevent like the next theoretical Boston Marathon bombing. And we were gonna try to do anything we could to prevent something like this from ever happening again. The first thing that we jumped into were drones. Um, obviously you can't line a 26 mile race with security the whole way through. So the only viable option is a drone. It's small, it can be in the air, which is the entire point of it. Um, it can cover a huge distance in a short time and scan everybody underneath it. So if you have a few drones up over the marathon, you can take a, you can cover a lot of area. Um, so our thoughts were to place a black powder scanner on a drone. Um, that didn't work, they don't exist right now. We wanted to place a chemical sniffer on a drone, couldn't get that to work. Uh, we wanted to place a metal detector on a drone. We thought if we put a metal detector on it and we had a certain threshold on the metal detector shooting downward, we could pick up the exact amount of metal that might be in uh, a pressure cooker and try to avoid picking up a fire hydrant. So we started to look into these drones pretty significantly. I know uh, personally, Lieutenant Colonel Clay Gardner, he was in Special Forces, uh, worked at the Pentagon. He's now at uh, Hanscom Air Force Base up in New Hampshire. Also uh, works for Lincoln Labs. He knows a ton about um, the policies of a lot of these uh, different remote sensing devices, where they are. He was explaining to me they're, they're all over our highways, our bridges. Everywhere you go, they're just hidden in plain sight. Um, he didn't have a ton of specifics on the actual tech, which is what we needed. So he passed me off to one of his colleagues, Stephen Newman, who's also a U.S. Army co uh, Corps of Engineers, and he's specifically a remote sensing scientist. So he ran us through a bunch of different sensors, um, different applications that we might be able to use. The problem is they're huge. They're all for Predator drones, airplanes. They won't work on a drone, and I can't fly a Predator drone over Boston because um, that wouldn't end well. He relayed me to Colonel Paul Craven, and he's fantastic. He's actually a capabilities manager, man, manager for the unmanned aerial systems at the U.S. Army Aviation Center of Excellence, which is really top of the line. Um, he was, he's an important guy, so it was really cool to talk to him. He knew a lot more about regulation and policy than he did the actual tech. Um, one of the things he pointed out that started to show our downfall in this whole drone theory was that to fly a drone over Boston like that with all the people below it, um, the possibility of it being hacked or crashing, it has to be tethered. Um, and that kind of defeats the purpose of having a drone cover a 26 mile race. So that started to weigh on us. Uh, Bill Jones was, is a subordinate of Colonel Cravey and um, he is way more technical in that sense. Um, he actually works with the smaller drones and the equipment on it. And he was really the nail in the coffin for this whole drones cover the Boston Marathon thing. He pretty much explained to us that all the tech available to us right now, uh, none of it's gonna do what we want it to do, or at least the stuff that might do it isn't unclassified, so we can't see it. <clears throat> At that point, we decided to take a step back because we still wanted to stay in this realm, but we knew that this drone thing wasn't exactly gonna work. Um, we started to look at terrorists as a whole and terrorist data. And we found that there's about five, since 2001, there's been about five attacks per day, killing over 100, 182,000 people. The numbers are astonishing. Of those attacks, we found that 50, 51%, over 51% of them, are used, um, they use bombings or explosives, some sort of explosives. They, they use uh, guns sometimes, knives sometimes, but when you have 51% of the attacks, of explosives is definitely something to pay attention to. From there, we tried to find the effectiveness of these explosive attacks. So, of these attacks that they were plotting and trying to carry out, how many were effective? How many did they actually get through with? Well, they got through with over 75% of them. Um, on average, I mean, even in 2010, we got to up to 45%, but that's just gonna drop like it has in, in this graph right here. It's, it goes up and down based on the technology available to them and how hard they're willing to work to accomplish their goal. We started to look at specific attacks to try to find out what exactly was going on at these specific attacks. This is uh, Centennial Olympic Park bombing. Um, he carried in three pipe bombs. 
and they were actually found before they went off, and they still managed to kill two people. But he had to sneak these bombs in through security in the park to get them in a place somewhere he did. The Madrid train bombings in 2004, these guys went through um, tra commuter train security with, with explosives on them, uh, four of them, and they went into a train and ended up killing 192 people as they all detonated at the same time. Just 2016, the Nikita Mall bombing uh, in Baghdad, these guys got bombs through mall security and set them off there where they killed another 12. And just last month, the Shiite Mosque, where they walked into a mosque with bombs and ended up killing 22 people. So here's our problem statement. This is what we came up with. This is what we were trying to fix. You have five terrorist attacks a day. Um, over 75% of them succeed, which means that there's probably six or seven attempts per day. Uh, we catch two of them. Over 182,000 deaths, which is insane over the past 16 years. Um, over 50% of them are explosive, so we're obviously seeing a trend. This is what they like to do. Um, and the most important thing is that most of these attacks, they have to pass through a pinch point of some sort. So they have to get through a security or a door or, or some sort of pinch point where they have to go through um, to get into the target that they're trying to hit. We took those statements and we came up with our own goals. So we wanted to analyze the trends of these terrorist attacks, find out what they're doing, and come up with a common denominator. The second part of this goal was to use that common denominator to design a system where we could exploit it and hopefully catch them uh, well before they're able to set anything off in that sense. The first thing we need to do was look at what they're using. For uh, most parts, an IED, an improvised explosive device. They're really easy, they're simple, they're small. Um, five main components, it's a container, power supply, trigger, a detonator, and then a main charge. I mean, as you can see here, they're, they're really small, they're really easy to make, and you can pack them as, as big or small as you want, really. How easy are they? I YouTubed how to make an IED. Um, I got 56,000 results, and that's just YouTube. Um, it doesn't include the dark web, where 99% of the internet is, and most of your terrorist attack, uh, activities occurring. So there's tutorials, there's, um, that's where they're doing their trainings. This is just YouTube, and I got 56,000 results. So they're easy to make, and the information is out there. There's a lot of different styles as well. Um, they're using pipe bombs, they're using, they're filling gasoline tank, uh, tankers, they're attaching cell phones to them, they have pressured explosives. Um, the, the bomb at the Boston Marathon were pressure cookers, they were packed inside backpacks. We did find that common denominator though. It's black powder. Um, almost all the ter uh, terrorist attacks that we looked into, the terrorists used black powder as their main explosive um, to, that was their fuel, that was their accelerant. Um, that's what really packed the punch. So we had to exploit black powder in some way. Now black powder is 75% potassium nitrate, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur. The uh, sulfur and charcoal as does the fuels, and then your potassium nitrate is your accelerant, it's your oxidizer. We wanted to see where these attacks, what was vulnerable, what target areas were vulnerable, where were these t attacks going to occur? One of the biggest locations around the world, thank God, hasn't happened in the U.S. yet. Sporting events. Um, they're highly. There's a, there's a ton of people. They're super densely packed together, um, and usually there's people watching not only in the arena but on TV. So it's a huge target for terrorists. 135 million people attend just the four major sports in the United States per year. That's not including the people watching on TV. Um, it's not including Europe, European <coughs> soccer or NASCAR. So the numbers are really in the billions of people who watch sporting events per year. The goal of terror is to put, to put the most terror in as many people as you can, and that's what they're going to try to do, and that's why these are such high-value targets. We had to pick one of these places, so I went back to Boston, I picked Fenway Park. This is where we did our analysis of you know, what security systems do they have in place and maybe how, how can we improve what they have. Now, that doesn't mean that what we came up with only works at Fenway Park. Uh, you could put it in a mosque, you could put it in a mall, you could put it in a train station, whatever works. But this is what we used to analyze and then critique. 
First of all, they do have a 12 zone uh, metal detectors that everyone walks through. There's five gates at Fenway Park, 28 of these, um, and 24 per gate. They're only $2,500 a pop. They're really not that expensive. You also get waved down. There's the 40 guys at each gate with these. Um, they're just checking for stuff on your armpits, between your legs, wherever else you might hide stuff. The additional stuff they have is crash poles, which is actually they're ahead of their they're ahead of the game because the recent uh, terrorist trend has been to drive cars through crowds, or trying to have someone drive a car through Fenway Park. So they have those up to withstand cars. They also have 400 security security agents and dogs to smell bombs, drugs. Um, guns, whatnot. They do have a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, the most obvious one is that they pass, you pass your phone and your wallet and your camera around the detectors when you walk in, um, which is kind of a huge fault in my eyes. They also have no chemical or nuclear sniffers. Um, we're getting a little bit out of our black powder here, but they're definitely still threats and we need to look into them. Black powder itself is completely undetectable. You could walk in with a pack of it in your back pocket, no one would know. We wanted to start looking into, you know, how could we improve this? The first thing we saw, the, the most obvious thing we saw, were these radiation detectors and chemical sniffers. They cover a decent range, you only probably need one per gate. Um, it's not like you need to hit every person with one of these. They don't detect black powder, but they're cheap enough where you can buy five of them and cover all your bases just in case. So this is where we got into how to detect uh, black powder. How do you pick it up? Um, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. So I'm not a chemist, but I'm going to do my best to explain this to you guys. Um, the thing you see on the left is what they use at airports. Um, when you get your hand swiped by a cotton swab and then they stick it in the machine, um, they're doing mass spectrometry on uh, the residue on your hand to see if you've been playing with explosives. You only need five to seven microliters to make this work. So if you have touched a bomb like at all and not been perfectly careful about it, there's going to be residue on your hands somewhere. Um, you have to be really careful about it to not get caught. This is at Animal Kingdom, uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom. They started this a few years ago where they're doing uh, biometric fingerprint scanning as you go in. They don't use it a ton for security. They use it more for personal identification. You can uh, put your fingerprint down here and then it gets you into other parks and it opens your locker. We want to turn it into a security thing. So we're going to keep the scanner on and then we're going to add a little box that goes over the scanner. And in this box, you're going to stick your hand into the box and as you're going through your biometric fingerprint scan, you're going to have a little brush of air just come over your hand. You probably won't even notice it. Uh, this air is going to carry particles that were on your hands off your hand and they're going to continue down into the GCMS, which is what I'll get into in a second. At the same time that's happening, the ticket that you just got scanned is going to go into the database with your GMS, GCMS sample, as well as a picture of you going through that security. So at the same time, in one instance, you're going to have your picture, your ticket number, uh, where you're sitting and everything, who bought the ticket, your fingerprint, and a sample that's going into a GCMS machine all uh, under one file going into a database. This is the first part of the GCMS, the gas chromatography. So what happens here is your sample that comes brushing off your hand into this machine, it's gonna come down here and it's gonna get picked up by a carrier gas, which is usually either hydrogen or helium. Um, there it gets picked up and flows through a column. Uh, they have a lot of different columns, you can change them out based on what you're looking for um, and what you're trying to separate. But for black powder, most of the things I saw said that they use glass, and it's gently heated glass for this. Um, and as it goes through the column, the different things in your hand get, they get strung out and separated into different components. Um, and that's really the purpose of this machine. And after they're separated and strung out into each other different components, that's when they go into the, det the detector. And that mass spectrometer is the detector in this case. So, as black powder comes through as a compound, it comes right up here, and it's going to get shot with an electron gun, which is pretty cool. It's just firing electrons at your compound, and there it breaks your compound up and knocks electrons off it. So they turn into cations, um, broken up pieces of cations. The thing is that all compounds break up the exact same way every time. So you can tell, well I'll get there in a second. 
they get broken up into cations, positively charged cations, and they reflect against this positive grid and shoot down the tube. And they go right past that electromagnet in the middle, and based on their charge, their size, um, they're going to reflect and bend differently going through, the, uh, going through that pipe towards the detector. Now the detector is going to pick up how much came in, how fast it came in, and what charge it has. Um, so as you can see here, um, there's a drift time for these as well as your um, attenuation. And I have three examples here that are all fairly similar actually. Uh, match head, firecracker, and black powder, which you can see this is what uh, someone looking at the screen analyzing this would be looking at. And if you're seeing that one at the top there, that means that you're running into somebody who's got black powder residue on their hands. We broke this down into three phases. The first phase should, in theory, take two to, two to five minutes. Um, that's where you get your fingerprint scanned, you're getting a GCMS test. Um, you have your ticket strung out and you have a picture taken of yourself. Now let's say that that GCMS test three minutes later comes back and says, hey, we got black powder on this guy. Um, here's all his information. So that'll pop up in phase two. And that's where you have someone seeing the results and then forwarding those results to security throughout the park. Um, security, are, they're going to have phones with apps that are directly related to the GCMS uh, analyst machine. And they're going to be able to see where the guy was sitting, a picture of his face, um, all the information about him. The third phase is you're going to have security monitoring all the cameras throughout the park or wherever you are, um, trying to find this guy now that you know what he looks like and where he's supposed to sit. You're also going to have security running around trying to find his seat and where he might be in the park. The whole thing should take between five to ten minutes, um, which means that if somebody walked in with a bomb and we caught it for black powder, they would have five to ten minutes to get to wherever they're going to set the explosive off. More likely than not, they haven't made it far enough to actually set it off yet. So that was our, that was our main goal. We did an economic analysis on this. This is the current security at Family Park. Um, they spend just over four and a half million dollars a year in security. And they're paying Hanley Ramirez $22 million. So they definitely have the money. Um, Hanley's batting 250, so he could use a pay cut. This new cost, all we're trying to add is some radiation detectors, some chemical sniffers, and this GCMS system that will be able to detect black powder. The whole thing is going to change you from that 4.65 to 5.23. It's not even an extra million dollars. Um, and it's not, it's not, it's nothing that these major league teams really need to worry about financially. So I'm not an artist, but I did my best. The S disappeared for somehow. But I did my best to show you what this might look like coming into a park. You're going to walk through the metal detector like you always had. And before you go through the, into the actual gate, you're just going to stick your hand in um, like you would at Disney World. And the whole thing, that, that process takes two seconds. It's standing out. Um, the entire thing is not expensive financially. It's not going to be time consuming from the people going through the park. So the real question is, you know, how much are these lives worth? If we put one of these in a mosque or we put one of these in a train station, is it worth spending the extra $750,000 and two seconds of your day? to possibly catch someone trying to get into a train station, mosque, or mall with a bomb. So thank you. I want to thank um, Lieutenant Colonel Clayton Gardner, uh, Colonel Paul Cravey, uh, Bill Jones, and Stephen Newman, as well as my advisors. Um, Dr. Walton couldn't make it today. He really helped me to try to form this idea. Um, and Dr. Bachman really helped me with the science of it all and put it all together for me. So I want to thank you guys. Questions? Yes. You mentioned something about the airport security and that they have devices like this. Yep. What's the current status with them using GCMS in our, in our airports? So you get, um, because it takes time, they don't, you don't get your hand swiped and then continue through like you would here. You get your hands, you're going to get stops. They take up, they pick somebody, it's like one in 50 people, whatever. Uh -huh. um, and you get stopped and you get your hand swiped and you wait for the results to come back, and then they say, okay, you're good to go. 
Um, it doesn't take too long, it's probably only two minutes of your day, but it's not efficient enough to put into a ballpark where you're trying to get 38,000 people in, in a matter of an hour. So, it, so they're using it in the airports, but it's just, since it takes a while, they don't scan everybody, they, they just do a random they do a, sample. They, they pick a sample size, and they, um, they have to make, so you need to actually, you can't pick up black powder like from the sky. Like I can't see black powder through thermal. So I have to physically have it, like I have to touch it to know it's there, um, which is why they use a cotton swab. I'm trying to replace that cotton swab with a brush of air that's going to blow these particles off your hand and into the sample that I want. So why is it that it takes them so long at the airport? Is that because they don't let the passenger proceed until the results come back? Yeah, no, it doesn't take too long. I mean, you're only there for two minutes, but they're going to stop you. Yeah. They're going to wipe your hand, and then they're going to walk to the machine. They're going to test it. The test only takes a few seconds, and then they're going to come back and tell you you're good to go. Um, but yeah, they make you wait the whole time. Whereas your system, you allow the people to pass through, but you've got a facial recognition, yeah. you've got their fingerprint, you know which their ticket stuff was. Yep. So yours would let the person go through faster, but generally you're just going to track them until those results come in. Yep. So, I mean, if, if you come back and your sample wasn't picked up for any black powder, nothing will happen with any of the information that we took. Yeah. If it comes back with black powder, that's when we're going to get all your info pop up on the screen and say, hey, this guy's in the park right now. He walked in at 1214, and here's his picture, his identification, his ticket number. Go find him. Nice. Nice. Yep. Do you flip the process and do the scan prior to walking into the medical metal detector and giving them less time? Yeah, no, you absolutely could. Um, that's actually probably a better idea. If you put the GCMS in front of the metal detectors and the wanding, so that by the time the tests come back, they're even farther back because they have to do those next steps. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Is that it? Yeah. Is there a company that makes this system already? Or this, like what I designed, yeah. no. So this was this was our this is our innovative idea. There's definitely GCMS machines out there. Yeah. But again, they take um, they take injections of physical samples. So to have this whole it's the whole blower uh, process. That's new. That's something that we came up with. And obviously, I can't test it in a year or build it in a year. But uh, it's definitely something that should be looked into. So you guys start a company. Um, I need to make a few bucks first, <laughs> then, then maybe we'll see. I'll call you in a few years. Nice. Nice. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Well done, sir.